Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Elish. I'm from Johns Hopkins University, and my co-moderator is Chris Gare from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And we are honored to welcome you to the first scientific session of this golden anniversary APSA meeting. Our session will focus on gastrointestinal surgery. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind the speakers that they will have four minutes for the presentation, and that will be followed by four minutes for questions and discussion. To the audience members who wish to ask a question or pose a comment, please step up to a microphone, speak clearly, loudly, state your name and your institution, for we are uh, doing an audio recording as has been tradition. I'd also like to remind the scores in the audience, uh, the scores for the uh, Folkman Awards, to bring up their scoring sheets at the end of the session and, and give them to either Chris or myself. And now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jamie Nell from Boston Children's Hospital up to the podium to present her work entitled Short-Term Outcomes in Pediatric Intestinal Failure Patients with Culture-Proven Small Bowel Bacterial Overgrowth with co-authors Duggan, Han, Hong, Lou, Modi, Jessix, and Carrie. Dr. Nell. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. Children with intestinal failure often have altered anatomy and motility that predisposes them to small bowel dilation and resultant small bowel bacterial overgrowth, which is defined as the presence of abnormally high bacterial counts in the proximal small bowel. SBVO in patients with intestinal failure has been associated with feeding intolerance and prolonged PN dependence. Gold standard diagnosis includes endoscopic culture of duodenal aspirates, demonstrating greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units of any bacterial species. And treatment typically consists of cyclical antibiotic therapy. We therefore sought to evaluate the short-term outcomes of patients with intestinal failure undergoing targeted antibiotic therapy for SBVO, including growth characteristics, enteral tolerance, and change in symptoms. We conducted a retrospective review of children uh, less than 18 years old, who were seen at a single center multidisciplinary intestinal failure clinic from 2010 to 2018 who had positive duodenal cultures. Intestinal failure was diagnosed or di defined as history of PN dependence greater than or equal to 90 days. Data on outcomes of interest as well as antibiotic therapy were collected six months prior to endoscopy, at the time of endoscopy, and six months after endoscopy. We identified 57 intestinal failure patients over a 10-year period who had positive duodenal cultures. The mean age in endoscopy was 4.1 years. The most common etiologies of intestinal failure were intestinal atresia and gastroschisis. And 16.4% of patients had chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction. Residual neonatal small bowel length was approximately 64 centimeters. And 77.2% of patients were receiving parenteral nutrition at the time of endoscopy. The bacterial species identified in duodenal aspirates are consistent with previously published organisms identified in intestinal failure patients. The most commonly identified gram-positive species include viridens group streptococci, lactobacillus, and enterococcus species. The most commonly identified gram-negative species include E. coli, Klebsiella, and Haemophilus species. It's important to recognize that there is no stringent distinction between flora found in the oropharynx and those found in the gastrointestinal tract. Species that are more typically found in the oropharynx and may represent oral contaminants include viridens group streptococci, staph aureus, rothia species, Haemophilus species, uh, pseudomonas, and Neisseria species. Weight, height, and BMI for HZ score based on CDC standards were evaluated at the time of endoscopy and six months after. There were no statistically significant, significant, uh, statistically significant differences in any growth parameters for following targeted therapy for SPVO. There was also no significant change in enteral tolerance. We next evaluated symptoms of SBVO at the time of endoscopy and six months after. There were statistically significant improvements in emesis or feed intolerance, abdominal pain, high stool output, and GI bleeding after targeted therapy for SBVO. Antibiotic regimens remained highly variable pre and post duodenal culture. There was no significant difference in the weeks per month receiving antibiotics or in the average number of antibiotics a patient was prescribed. <laughs> 
Commonly used antibiotics included ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and Bactrim. In conclusion, children with positive duodenal cultures who underwent targeted therapy showed improvement in, emesis, in symptoms of emesis or feed intolerance, abdominal pain, high stool output, and GI bleeding after six months. However, there was no observed improvement in growth characteristics or enteral tolerance during this time. There are currently no standardized guidelines for treatment of SBVO, and antibiotic therapy remains highly variable. The long-term consequences of chronic antimicrobial therapy remain uncertain, and further research is warranted. I'd like to thank my mentors, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for that nice presentation, Michael Helmreth, Cincinnati. So what's your recommendation for duration of antibiotics? Uh, how do you screen these if you're on antibiotics? And uh, do you have any recommendations for us? Thank you for this data. Uh, thank you for the question. I think we use a system where we typically trial antibiotics and, and target it towards symptoms. Um, duration of antibiotics is highly variable among our patients, and what we typically will try to do is wean patients off as we are able, although we tend to, we tend to struggle with that. Patients who need these antibiotics tend to be on them for quite some time. I think moving forward, we hope to be able to define a more specific guideline um, for use of antibiotics in these patients. Brad Warner, St. Louis, congratulations. Um, I was wondering, did you do, you, it seemed to me that you just looked at culture positive bacteria. Did you do any 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing to determine you know, exactly what's there that might not be culturable is one question. And the other is, uh, do you have comparisons of your duodenal aspirates with someone else that might be normal? And is there a difference in bacterial flora? Um, that's a great question. Um, so we did not do 16S ribosomal sequencing. Um, it's something that other groups have done, but we do not routinely use in our clinical practice. Um, we did not compare this to, to normal patients, but typically the cutoff of 10 to the fifth is something that we see. A lot of these gram-negative and anaerobic organisms you should not expect to see in the proximal duodenum. John Bleacher, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you had taken cultures and considered your therapy to be targeted, but uh, the most common antibiotic that you used was metronidazole, and all of the bacteria that you commonly got in your cultures were, wasn't uh, uh, targeted with metronidazole. Thank you. That's a very important point to bring up. Um, at our institution, we actually do not uh, test sensitivities for anaerobic bacteria, which is something that we've been focused on since doing this study and working on evaluating those, those bacterial um, organisms. Um, the majority of patients on antibiotics were actually on two, and so there are multiple coverage options. Flagyl tends to be the antibiotic that we use empirically most frequently to try and target anaerobes, and we see a lot of good responses to that. Um, but it is something that we're focused on, on looking further into. I have a couple of questions. Uh, did you do uh, repeat cultures after therapy first? And also, um, did, um, um, well, you can go ahead and answer that. Um, we did not routinely, but in some patients from, from treating these patients, I know that we do do them. Um, and sometimes they grow different organisms after having been on different antibiotics, and sometimes they don't grow anything. And do patients that have the duodenal cultures and then later develop clapses, do they grow out the same bugs? That's also a great question. We did look at the number of clabsies that we saw both in the six months before and six months after duodenal culture, and there were no statistically significant differences. Um, we also looked at the organisms, and there was no overlap between the, or, uh, the organisms that grew in duodenal culture and what grew out in clabsy, which was something that we had specifically tried to look at. Thank you. Kristen Zeller, Wake Forest. Um, did the patients who were positive for lactobacillus species, did that correlate with the use of probiotics? That's a great question. So uh, our patients are not routinely started on probiotics by us, but many of the parents feel that that helps their symptoms and they're given outside of our prescription uh, tracking system. So we were unable to identify with whether or not uh, identify whether or not that was something that happened, but we are very interested in it. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to our second Test. All right, we're going to move on to our second uh, speaker for today, Dr. Onafor uh, from the from the Warner Group. Will talk to us about 
chronic lymphatic remodeling impairs cholesterol homeostasis after small bowel resection. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Malnutrition is a major contributor of morbidity and mortality in short gut syndrome. The loss of intestinal length causes nutrition, nutrition malabsorption, and therefore mo many patients require TPN, which then is associated with its own set of mor mortalities and morbidities. One of these key nutrients is cholesterol, which is an important constituent of cell membranes, steroids, as well as bile acids. In our mass model of short gut syndrome, there's a significant reduction in total plasma cholesterol in resected mice, both 50% and 75%, compared to our controls, both sham and non-operative. Now the question becomes, what is this reduction of total plasma cholesterol from? Is it a decrease in endogenous synthesis of cholesterol or a lack of absorption? Since we perform a proximal bowel obstruction er, resection, and this is the primary site of dietary absorption of cholesterol, we believe that it's because of absorption, which leads to the question of how short gut syndrome affects cholesterol absorption mechanistically. Now, we first wanted to prove this by looking at cholesterol endogenous synthesis as well as dietary cholesterol absorption through specific markers. Now, both are reduced in synthesis and absorption. However, there's a more profound reduction in cholesterol dietary absorption. To further prove this, we then performed an oral cholesterol gavage with fluorescent cholesterol and saw that over time, there is a marked decrease in absorption of cholesterol in our resected mice compared to sham controls and non-operative controls. So now we have proven that there is definitely a deficiency in absorption. However, I haven't told you yet what the reason is mechanistically. So in order to understand this, you have to know that the intestinal villi absorbs cholesterol through two different mechanisms. One is cholesterol can be packaged in chylomicrons and travel through the lymphatic vasculature. Or secondly, it can be packaged into HDL and travel through the portal vein. First, going to focus on the lymphatic vasculature. So we did this by looking at both lymphatic morphology as well as functional chylomicron transport. When you look at lymphatic morphology, we first stained with immunofluorescence for LIV1, which is a marker of subepithelial lymphatic capillaries. And you can see here phenotypically in both proximal gut as well as distal gut, there's a dilation in subepithelial lymphatics in our SBR mice compared to our sham controls. Additionally, if you quantify this, there's a significant 50% dilation in the proximal gut and a 30% dilation in the distal gut. Additionally, I performed whole mount immunofluorescent imaging of prox one mesenteric collecting ducts. Now you can see here, if you quantify this, there's also an increase in average branch width as well as budding areas. Now all of these different phenotypic things such as dilation and budding can decrease your lymphatic flow and therefore compromise your chylomicron transport. So then I wanted to directly assess chylomicron transport and do this by giving an oral gavage of triglycerides. And you can see that there's an impairment of triglyceride absorption over time. Now all of this shows that there is an impairment in our lymphatic vasculature as well as an impairment in our chylomicron transport. However, I didn't think it was significant enough to account for that huge difference in total cholesterol absorption that I showed you in the beginning. Therefore, I also looked at the portal venous system absorption of cholesterol through HDL. As you can in our, see in our model, there is a marked reduction in portal venous cholesterol over time in our resected mice. Additionally, the expression level of ABCA1, which is a transporter in the proximal bowel for cholesterol transport into the portal vein via packaging into HDL is markedly reduced in our model. So both of these show that there is a marked reduction in HDL in the portal vein. Now, therefore, in conclusion, our lymphatics drastically remodel, and this mildly impairs cholesterol transport through chylomicrons. Additionally, portal venous cholesterol in the form of HDL is significantly impaired. Now the question is, what is the clinical consequence of this? Is it just a reduction in malabsorption? We don't think so. We think that also HDL uses LPS as a co-transporter. When LPS is attached to HDL, it goes to the liver and actually cannot activate TLR4, which is its receptor. Now in our model, where there's a decreased HDL, there's actually increased free LPS. This LPS can go to the liver, act on the TLR4 receptor, increase your inflammation, and result in intestinal failure-associated liver disease, which is another major morbidity of short gut syndrome. <laughs>
Now this is further proved in our research in that you can actually see there's an increase in portal venous LPS or endotoxin in our resected mice. Additionally, we have shown that there is increased fatty liver disease in our resected model, which is TLR4 dependent. Therefore, we think that this is a possible mechanism for the development of int intestinal failure associated liver disease associated with short gut syndrome. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dave Hacken from Johns Hopkins. That was beautiful, innovative, and very well presented. Thank you. Uh, two questions. First, how dynamic are these two processes? Can the restructuring of the lymphatics, which are probably underappreciated, compensate for perhaps uh, issues around absorption? And, and can you use lymphatic measurements somehow to predict who's going to be able to get off TPN and who's going to adapt. Uh, really great studies. Thank you. That's a great question. So um, actually at AEP I presented the early remodeling of lymphatics, which actually happens immediately at post-op day three. And this is chronic remodeling, so it's all after 10 weeks when you would de essentially develop IFALD or intestinal failure associated liver disease. So essentially it is almost immediate. Now the difference between the post-operative day seven and now is that the impacts are more drastic. So you see, you saw that kind of spider webbing, which is way more drastic in long term. So we think the longer that you go out, the more your lymphatics remodel. Now in terms of its transport, I actually can cannulate the lymphatic duct and I'm currently trying to essentially, um, I can show you. We have a photo activatable mouse to traffic HDL. And so you use a laser and you can put it into the gut and then watch trafficking of HDL. So this immunofluorescence essentially can either traffic into the lymphatics or into the portal vein and you can measure the fluorescence directly that way. That's so cool. I promise this was not a plant. It was an honest question. <laughs> it was it. It was it. <laughs> really great job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marshall Schwartz, Philadelphia. So, very nice presentation and, a, and an interesting concept. But what I'd like to ask you is you didn't mention anything about the enteropathic cycle of bile and the distal ileum, and, and that's where it's absorbed because cholesterol metabolism and the total body cholesterol is largely dependent on that enteropathic cycle of bile. If you've lost your distal uh, ileum, uh, that really changes dramatically the whole physiology of cholesterol metabolism absorption. And I don't know what percentage uh, of that is related to that enteropathic cycle of bile or versus direct uh, absorption through uh, lymphatics. So that's a great question. And so actually, um uh, if you look at this structure here, so just just like you were saying, the proximal bowel is where normally you absorb your dietary cholesterol, and your distal bowel is where you have the enterohepatic absorption of bile acids and have your production of cholesterol. Now, in our mouse model, since we do a proximal bowel resection, the two markers of endogenous synthesis, so leanthestral, if it was increased, if it was increased, you would think that there was a reduction in your enterohepatic system, but since it's decreased, we are focusing on the proximal bowel absorption of dietary cholesterol. So I totally agree with you, and I think there is definitely a role for that, and we've actually started performing distal resections now to see what the difference is between our proximal resections and our distal resections, which I think are probably going to be drastically different because of the enterohepatic cholesterol absorption. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Next paper is entitled A Comparison of SMOF Lipid and Intralipid in the Early Management of Infants with Intestinal Failure, uh, to be presented by Dr. Piper. Uh, Co authors Kesson, Nguyen, Hana Asapa, Nayak, Pansuk, Barris, and Dr. Piper. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work, and we have no disclosures. Um, so children with intestinal failure require long-term parental nutrition support, and unfortunately, many of them will develop some degree of hepatic cholestasis as a result. This is felt to be multifactorial, but we know that intravenous lipid emulsions do play a role. Traditionally, in Intralipid was the only available option as an intravenous lipid emulsion. However, more recently, we do have alternatives, one of which is SMOF, which is a mixed lipid and has a more balanced omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. 
which is thought to be uh, anti-inflammatory. However, despite this, there are currently no standardization of practice among intestinal rehab programs with regard to initial lipid management for these children. So we wanted to compare two different strategies at two different institutions. So at Children's Health in Dallas, um, they start babies on intralipid, and if cholestasis develops, we'll switch to an alternative lipid. Whereas at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, uh, we start SMOF uh, as upfront therapy um, initially. So we wanted to compare the incidence and degree of cholestasis in these two patient populations. So this was a retrospective review. We had 21 babies who received SMOF and 23 babies who received intralipid for the first eight weeks of parenteral nutrition support. All of these babies had intestinal failure. We looked at their overall trend in bilirubin, how high the bilirubin got, and how long it took for it to normalize, as well as nutritional intake and growth. We found that the two groups of babies were similar with regard to gestational age and birth weight. However, there was a higher percentage of babies with necrotizing enterocolitis in the intralipid group and a higher percentage with atresia in the SMOF group. Overall, when we looked at the entire group, we found that the incidence of cholestasis was similar, with about 80% of babies in the SMOF group developing cholestasis compared to 90% in the intralipid group. Cholestasis was defined as a conjugated bilirubin greater than two for at least two consecutive weeks in the absence of uh, an infection. Um, we found that the peak bilirubin level was also similar between the two groups. However, the intralipid group did take slightly longer to normalize the bilirubin compared to the SMOF group. Here's a, a, a pictorial of the bilirubin trajectory over the first eight weeks. You can see that's similar between the two groups. And again, that the peak bilirubin is also similar, but that the intralipid group took about a month longer to normalize the bilirubin. When we looked at nutritional intake, the babies in the intralipid group were receiving a slightly less IV lipid. Uh, however, this did not impact growth uh, because the uh, discrepancy in calories was made up in carbohydrate. Uh, lastly, we wanted to look at one uh, additional high-risk group of babies, and these were babies who were receiving no enteral nutrition at all during the eight-week period. So we had 13 babies in the intralipid group and nine babies in the SMOF group. And although there was no significant difference in the incidence of cholestasis, there was a trend towards higher level of cholestasis in the intralipid group. Here for that subset is the trajectory of the bilirubin over time, and you can see it didn't differ significantly, nor did the peak bilirubin or time to normalization. Uh, and these babies, their growth did suffer somewhat during the eight weeks. However, there was no difference between the two. So in conclusion, we found that the early use of SMOF in all babies with intestinal uh, failure did not significantly decrease the incidence or degree of cholestasis. However, it is possible that in babies at particularly high risk for cholestasis, those who are receiving very little in the form of enteral nutrition may benefit from using SMOF early on. Uh, in addition, the use of SMOF does allow for an increased lipid delivery, which may have additional benefits. I'd like to acknowledge the intestinal rehab programs at both Dallas and Vancouver. Thank you. Hey, Hannah, great work. Baron Modi from Boston. Um, two questions. One is if your intralipid group had a lower overall dosage of lipid, was your GIR there significantly higher? Did you look at that specifically? And second, what was your therapy once patient patients developed cholestasis, did you convert them to a different lipid source or did you um, keep them on the same source and just work on enteral nutrition? Thank you. Great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the uh, question. So um, the strategies that the two institutions, if the baby did develop cholestasis, so in the intralipid uh, group, if they developed cholestasis, we did minimize the lipid and that was usually down to about one and a half grams per kilo per day. Um, we, I actually didn't find a significant difference in the GIR, but they were getting getting more calories with carbohydrate, just probably over a bit of a longer duration. Um, and then in the SMOF group, uh, if they failed that, they would go to omega -Ven. And I should say in the intralipid group, if they failed the minimization, they would go to omega -Ven. So we had three patients in the intralipid group that switched to omega -Ven and one in the SMOF group that switched to omega -Ven. Um, I think, you know, the point here perhaps is that if you have a baby who you think is going to advance fairly well on enteral nutrition, 
you know, you probably are okay with intralipid. Um, but if you have high-risk babies that are going to be on it for quite a long time without enteral nutrition, which is probably the main um, preventative strategy uh, for IFAL, then you might be best with an alternative lipid. Hi, I'm Abigail Martin from AI DuPont Hospital for Children. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, at our intestinal failure program, we are actually using somophilipid as preemptive therapy for our patients that we predict will be on TPN for a long period of time. My question for you is whether you looked at biopsy data, and the reason I ask that is I think most of us who have done this long enough have realized that the using the bilirubin or cholestasis is really a poor marker for what is actually the fibrosis that occurs in the liver, which is really what's responsible for the morbidity and mortality in these patients. And so I'm wondering if you have any biopsy data to compare the two groups. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. I do think it's a poor marker as well, and that there are some long-term potentially negative effects even after the bilirubin has normalized. We, we do not have that data. We don't um, take them to the, we don't do biopsies without an, another procedure, and so we don't do them in isolation, so we don't have a lot of that data available. Tom Jaksik, uh, Boston Children's. Thank you for a superb uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering if you uh, did an independent analysis of uh, exactly how many omega-6 uh, fats the two groups uh, received and whether this is a dose effect or whether this is an effect of the specific other uh, um, aspects that may be uh, included in SMOF but not in intralipid. Thank you for the question. Um, we didn't do that, but that's actually a very interesting point and maybe something we could go back and do that would be uh, fairly doable. So thank you for that suggestion. Okay, thank you very much. So this session is dedicated to Dr. Morton Woolley. Uh, Dr. Woolley was ABSA's ninth president and a charter member of ABSA. Uh, the video was prepared by Dr. Mike Malicote from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Do something or are they okay. Rolly was a, uh, a patrician. He was a very good surgeon. He's wonderful with families, wonderful with kids. Terrific Do we have the video? He was a delight to scrub with and do cases with. When Jim Rosencrantz left, uh, Mort Woolley became. Uh, there should be some audio on this. There we go. Mort Woolley was a, uh, a patrician. He was a, a very good surgeon. He's wonderful with families, wonderful with kids. Terrific with students and residents. He was a delight to scrub with and do cases with. When Jim Rosencrantz left, uh, Mort Woolley became a uh, surgeon in chief. Once he became surgeon in chief here, the referral patterns from within the hospital migrated a bit away from the private practicing pediatric surgeons towards uh, Mort Woolley because uh, he was well known and well talented. He was a broadly based, well trained, well talented general pediatric surgeon who, d who did everything. He did uh, certainly did a lot of chest and abdomen and cancer 
improve the program. I think everybody recognized that uh, he was a true gentleman. On to the fifth talk because the presenter for the fourth talk is actually giving a concurrent talk and we'll come back at the end of the session to give his talk. So we're going to proceed with tissue engineering can restore esophageal continuity in long gap esophageal defects by using a cell span esophageal implant presented by Dr. Fink. Co-authors Jensen, Wansuk, Fodor, Rafadal, Sundaram, Paquin, Bouchard, and Jones from Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Elish and Geyer and the organizers for allowing us to present our work today. Uh, this study was uh, designed in conjunction with BioStage and is supported by BioStage funds and an NIH R44 grant. As we all know, the esophagus is a tubular uh, structure, and though it appears simple in design, it's very complicated in structure and function. Congenital or acquired esophageal defects can be devastating to children. Esophageal atresia can occur in 1 in 4,000 to 4,500 live births, and of those, 7 to 8% can be long gap. We know that current surgical strategies addressing long gap esophageal atresia are fraught with about a 20 to 40% morbidity rate. These are just some of the options that we have currently, such as the gastric pull-up, colonic interposition, dejunal interposition, and the Fokker procedure. What we sought to do with this technology is to use tissue engineering to create a structure that can bridge an esophageal gap and hopefully along the way enable the esophagus to regenerate. This is our model where we take, um, where we take um, cells, autologous cells, uh, we culture them in 2D cell culture, expand them, put them into a bioreactor where we culture them on a cell span esophageal implant, which is a polyurethane um, woven um, scaffold. Um, we do that for six days. We make sure they have metabolic and viability criteria. Then we implant them into an animal model to see how they grow. This is some of the work that we had done in the past where this is an adult porcine model where we, at day negative 28, harvest adipose tissue, expand the cells for two passages, then um, seed them on the bio, in the bioreactor on the scaffold for six days, and then implant them into the chest of um, a pig, an adult pig, that we have resected about five centimeters of the esophagus. And what you can see is at day 21, we remove the scaffold. The scaffold does need to be stented because it won't have enough integrity without a stent. Uh, we remove the scaffold and the stent, and what we see is a developing um, conduit that totally bridges the gap um, in the adult model. We sought to bring this to a pediatric model where we use um, Yucatan mini pigs. We do the same thing where we harvest adipose cells. We culture them for six days, um, and then we implant them. This is us implanting, and we take out a five centimeter defect, put in a six centimeter scaffold. Um, we remove the stent and scaffold at day 21, and then I'm going to show you the results. Doesn't seem to want to go. Um, one thing that happens when the cells are seeded into the scaffold, this is some of the analysis of the, um, of the cells, we can harvest about 6 to 13 grams of tissue. After passage 2, we get 30 to 50 million cells. We need 20 million to seed our scaffold. After six days in culture, we can see with the green staining on the uh, right of the slide that they're all alive, and that the red staining is just staining the nuclei, and they see the um, complete outer surface of the scaffold that we're implanting. When we look at some of the metabolic data of the cells in the culture in the bioreactor, we can see that they're utilizing glucose as evidenced by the decreasing glucose line here and producing lactate, meaning that the cells are metabolically active. When we take the scaffold out at day six, we can um, look at for expression of, by QRT-PCR, and we can see that they're expressing IL-10, 6, 8, TGF-beta-2, and VEGF-A, um, which will be important after. What you can see on endoscopy at day 21 is that the scaffold and the stent are um, easily removed. What you're seeing here is this portion is the regenerated or the neo-tissue that is created, and it completely bridges that five-centimeter gap that we created.
We do restent the pigs. We have to um, have a cereal um, restenting them every uh, three to um, about every three weeks, and usually up to six months. After six months, usually the tissue has enough integrity um, that we don't need to have the stent anymore. This is just us showing you that endoscopy over time shows that there's re-epithelialization of the tissue that occurs, and the, usually the entire tissue is re-epithelialized by six months. We performed, in these, in these Yucatan mini pigs, we performed um, barium swallow at 90 days. The um, head of the pig is up here. The pigs are in a sling. Um, this one is a control where I took out two centimeters of the esophagus and did a primary anastomosis. Um, and this one is the seated scaffold where there's a five centimeter defect and uh, replaced by a seated scaffold of six centimeters. And you can see that the barium swallow indicates that the tube is completely intact um, and that there's evidence of motility um, and function of the esophagus, even at 90 days. We perform serial CT scanning of uh, these animals. At day zero, what you can see is that there's a stent here. There's, um, there's no tissue around it, and you can't see the scaffold on the CT scan. At day seven, what you can see is, is that there's some neotissue that's grown around the stent. You can see in coronal images that there's tissue that bridges the entire gap. This is the area that was implanted. And the interesting thing at day 21 is that the aorta is here, and you can see vessels sprouting off the aorta to feed this neotissue. A pediatric radiologist blinded to our study took a look at our um, specimens. Um, and this was at uh, between day 7, 21, and 90. The two bars here, these are our, seated, are our control animal where we had just done a primary anastomosis. And the three bars here are our seated scaffold. What you can see is that day seven in the controls, um, you have a minimal amount of tissue, but it does grow over time. In our seated scaffold, what we found interesting is, is when you look at above and below the carina, this is, a, this is our implant zone, and at the carina, you don't have very much tissue at all at day seven. It gets a little bit more by day 21, but by day 90, you can see that the tissue is all grown in and it looks like it's growing in from both sides. On gross specimen, this is the surgical control where you can see um, we did a primary anastomosis. You see an esophageal tube, and when you open it up, you can see the area of the anastomosis is here, and it's completely epithelialized. Here's our seated scaffold. Once again, it's a tube. It's a little bit more disorganized on the outer surface, but you can see that there's been complete re-epithelialization. This is at 90 days with an epithelial ridge right here that still needs to be bridged. This is our unseated scaffold where we didn't put any autologous cells on it, much more disorganized and a larger epithelial um, bridge that has to be um, still um, uh, covered, um, but you can still see that the uh, scaffold itself works. This is just trichrome staining. The blue stains the fibrous tissue. This is our implanted um, seated scaffold. Here is the implant zone right here. Stratified squamous epithelium is uh, migrating down. You can see it still has a little bit more of a zone to re-epithelialize. The muscular layer you can see is not completely intact here, um, and this does form over time. This is our procedural control where it's a primary anastomosis. Our non-seated CEI, the thing that's um, notable here is that it's much more disorganized, although it does create a neotissue that bridges the gap. Um, finally, um, the last thing to say is that when we um, tagged our mesenchymal stem cells that we uh, used to seed the scaffold, we wondered what the fate of them was. Um, and here is just a, um, a long-term study that showed that the green cells uh, um, ended up around perivascular structures, indicating that they probably had some paracrine effect, but they were not seeding the neotissue or responsible for any of the growth that we saw. So in conclusion, these pilot studies demonstrate that there's a feasibility of implanting a cell-seeded synthetic polyurethane scaffold to bridge a long gap. The scaffold is extruded by 21 days postoperatively, which is important in a pediatric model because it allows the, the um, animal model to uh, regenerate its own um, esophageal tissue. Initial regeneration appears to be fibrovascular or neotissue and evidence of a vessel sprouting from the aorta. Adipose cells appear to be cluster around perivascular structures, so uh, in theory would have a paracrine effect as evidenced by some of the expression of the VEGF-A that we saw and some of the TGF-beta contributing to wound healing. Epithelialization does occur over time. It takes a team to do this. We've been working on this for a long period of time. I want to thank BioStage for all the help that they've done and in pushing this technology forward. Thank you.
we're, we're only going to have the opportunity for one brief question. Uh, very briefly, uh, Dave Tacken from Hopkins. Dr. Okay. Fink, beautiful, beautiful work as always. Uh, because tension is such an important um, problem in these patients, and this is really potentially a solution uh, for these patients where tension exists, have you had an opportunity in your bioreactor studies to put some sort of tension across your ex vivo model to see if you get either better healing or different transcriptional profiles or sure. something that we can learn what tension does to these these poor kids. Thanks that's, very much. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, we've started looking at that. I actually think tension is going to help the muscular ingrowth because of the stretch. It's going to organize the fibers more. We're just in preliminary work with that, growing them and, and maintaining their viability for a long period of time in culture. It's a little bit harder, but yes, yeah. we're, we're looking at that. Well, congratulations. Thanks. It's really great. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you. you. So our next talk will be uh, abstract number six, assessing the benefit of reoperation in patients who suffer from fecal incontinence after repair of their anorectal malformation. To be presented by Dr. Levitt, it looks like. A uh, collaborative project from Columbus as well as Spain. Neither are working. Here we go. So soiling after an anorectal malformation repair is due to either poor potential for bowel control or a complication related to the original surgery. And I put this uh, sand timer here to make the note that a properly done, or what the surgeon believes is a properly done repair, may manifest as incontinence four years later, and they don't know what they did wrong four years earlier, so how do they improve their technique? And a reoperation was traditionally offered only to those with a, quote, good potential for continence. We know that with a reoperation, the anatomy can be improved, but can this affect the functional result? So we aim to assess the benefit of redo PSARP by assessing continence outcomes, including validated surveys, and this included patient reported outcomes, and assessed patients' quality of life and our complications. This was a retrospective review. It included all ARM patients who underwent a redo PSARP for fecal incontinence, cloacas were excluded, and all patients underwent the following preoperative assessment, including medical and surgical history, validated surveys, and examination under anesthesia looking for the anoplasty position, the Hagar size of the anoplasty, particularly whether there was a stricture, whether there was rectal prolapse, and whether there was a remnant of the original fistula, a roof. Cysto and vaginoscopy were performed if necessary, and all patients had a sacral ratio calculated. Our postoperative protocol included no stomas. Patients were given clear liquids for five to seven days before they were advanced to a regular diet. No postoperative dilatations were used. And the patients were assessed at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months, both for countenance outcomes and quality of life. And here are our results. 682 patients were evaluated for fecal incontinence, and 153 we felt met criteria for a redo. The most common indication was an anal mislocation, as you see in this video. Next were strictures, remnants of the original fistula, a roof, the original rectum, as you see on the left picture, attached to the urinary tract, and the original vestibular fistula in the introitus. And 6% of patients had a unilateral or circumferential prolapse. Our complications included strictures managed by a Heineke Mikulitz anoplasty, rectal prolapse managed by trimming of the excess mucosa, urinary tract infections managed by antibiotics, and wound dehiscence that in all cases but one were managed by local wound care. And our continence outcomes, and of note, these were patient-reported outcomes, the first of these type in this kind of patient population. 
The Baylor, the Baylor survey demonstrated dramatic improvement. The Cleveland and Vancouver, which are more generic findings for constipation and urinary control, no difference, and quality of life also improved. So those were the two main findings, the Baylor score, particularly focused on ARM, and quality of life. The functional outcomes improved, as well as the quality of life. And our results further, in the cohort, those patients with good continence potential, namely a good sacrum and normal spine, 24% were clean, but 55% were made continent on laxatives, which means they developed voluntary bowel movements after their redo, none of whom had that before they had their redo. And of interest, in the poor continence group, poor sacrums and spine or both, 20% developed voluntary bowel movements, and 53% were clean on enemas. So in conclusion, we developed a standardized assessment for soiling after a PSAR, which must include identifying a potential anatomic explanation for the soiling. A redo can improve continence, cleanliness, quality of life, and can be done with minimal morbidity. And we believe redo should be done for good potential patients. 80% of these were clean, and 50% developed voluntary control, and even for poor potential patients. 73% are clean, and 20% surprisingly developed voluntary control. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. I, um, I have a question. 24% uh, of your patients had a stricture, and you said that you don't do dilatations. Would you continue taking care of these patients without dilatation, knowing that the patients have 24% chances of a stricture that you do uh, require an operation? And number two, another factor that determines whether what's going to be the result in reoperations is the history of uh, having removal of the rectum in the original procedure. When the patient lost the rectum and bowel was taken from the abdomen, those patients are not going to improve with their reoperation. I wonder if you took that into consideration. We did. Um, Dr. Pena, thank you for your great questions. Uh, first of all, with regard to stricture, um, we recognize that 24% of patients after a redo that develop a stricture is not an insignificant number, but dilating a five-year-old is not an insignificant intervention. So we basically accepted that and bring them back to the operating room and do a very minor skin level Heineken Maculitz plasty, which got them through, got them to a normal size anus thereafter. And most families, and as the surgeon I would agree, found that that was less troublesome than dilating them twice a day for six to seven months. So it's a complication we accept with an intervention that we think is safe and, and effective. With regard to your second question, I think is very important. There are a small number of these redo patients had an original abdominal perineal pull through the old operation before your major advance of the PSARP um, in 1980. Um, amazingly, some of those patients with no rectum did actually, were able to develop bowel control, but only the patients that had good sphincters and good sacrums and good spines. So the, con the concept that you cannot have bowel control without a rectum and ARM, I believe is not correct. You can have control, but you must have good sphincters and a good spine to accompany them. We were expecting those patients to be incontinent. So the major finding here was not only could we improve patients who had potential for bowel control, which we suspected we could help, they, we helped more than we thought we would, but in the group that did not have good potential for bowel control, 20% of them developed voluntary bowel control, which was a bit of a surprise. So therefore, my criteria for offering a redo um, has broadened because I think we have to give, give kids a chance. And if they don't develop bowel control, at least we can be very confident that they can be clean with anti-grade um, enemas. Very nice. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.
<laughs> the next paper is intraoperative endocyanin green laser angiography and its value in predicting the vascular supply of tissues needed to perform cloacal anal rectal malformation and Hirschsprung reconstructions. Presented by Dr. Rentea, co-authors Halloran, Villanova, Sanchez, Ahmad, McCracken, Hewitt, Alexander, Weaver, Smith, Wood, and Levitt from uh, Nationwide. Complex pediatric colorectal reconstructions involve visual assessment of tissue perfusion. Strictures and failure of flaps based on vascular pedicles are serious complications which increase morbidity in cloaca, Hirschsprung's disease, and anorectal malformation. Tissue perfusion has been measured by active bleeding and tissue discoloration. Indocyanin green fluorescence angiography or ICGFA utilizes fluorescent dye to assess tissue perfusion in real time. We hypothesize that intraoperative use of ICGFA could be more accurate at tissue perfusion assessment than the surgeon's eye and could change intraoperative decisions in complex pediatric colorectal surgery. We performed a single institution retrospective review of 13 patients with cloaca, Hirschsprung's disease, and anorectal malformation over a four-year period in whom ICGFA spy elite imaging system was utilized to assess intraoperative tissue perfusion. Inclusion criteria for use of ICGFA was viability confirmation in the setting of visual viability change in intraoperative decision, as well as examination under anesthesia postoperatively were noted. How does the perfusion of these tissues appear? This is the native rectum and the mobilized colostomy, which was going to become the neovagina during a cloacal reconstruction. To the visual eye, they both look equally well perfused. However, when we assessed tissue perfusion using ICGFA, we noted that the native rectum does not demonstrate tissue perfusion. This is the rectum and native vagina following mobilization during cloaca repair. Which looks better or worse here? On ICGFA, the native rectum does not appear to perfuse, while the native vagina does. 13 patients presenting to our center utilized ICGFA during their reconstruction. Patients presented for evaluation at a mean of two years, consisting of three males and 10 females. A total of 13 patients were evaluated with cloaca, Hirschsprung's disease, and anal rectal malformation. Procedures performed utilizing ICGFA included cloaca repair, redo pull through for Hirschsprung's disease, redo cloacal repair, and primary pull through for anal rectal malformation. In assessing tissue perfusion using ICGFA versus the surgeon's eye, did operative plans change? In 69% of patients, the plan did not change. However, in 31% of patients, the plan did. The four cases where the case change significantly included issues with the neovagina viability in one case and issues with the distal rectum in three cases. In all cases, the native vagina was viable and pulled through. Additionally, on examination under anesthesia and in the immediate postoperative period, there were no ischemic complications. In conclusion, ICGFA correctly identified patients with poor tissue perfusion. It is a reproducible technique which does not utilize ionizing radiation. Finally, correctly assessing perfusion could improve outcomes in complex pediatric colorectal operations. Thank you. Mohammed Imran from Corpus Christi, Texas. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, have you used the uh, numerical values on the on the machine to, to determine the vascularity, or is it just the imaging? 
We've just started utilizing the imaging. There is the area under the curve that can be calculated, and I think that's really the next step because some of the adult literature has started to look at that. I know that the, the amount of tissue that can be resected could potentially maybe even be less in the future if we utilize the area under the curve. Okay. Yeah, we used uh, we we used this. We've been using it for quite some time now, and we used it in the uh, uh, the issue of Pegasus twin separation, um, and helped predict uh, what was unexpected in the vascular supply uh, in, in that situation. So it it can be really helpful in determining which baby is actually perfusing different parts of the bowel. Thank you so much. Thanks. I've used ICG in the, sorry, Dave Bliss from LA. I've used ICG for biliary surgery, and what I've noticed is it distributes very quickly, which is not a surprise. This is actually quite an old technology. How quickly do you need to do the imaging, and can you do serial imaging if you choose to do additional dissection? Mm -hmm. Um, so both great questions, thank you. So you can do serial imaging. The half-life is about three to four minutes. Um, it's, the image shows up fairly immediately after injection of ICG, so it's 0.3 to point, 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram injection by the anesthesia team. So we recommend that the, um, whether it's a handheld device or the actual arm of the spy imaging system is directly over the tissue that you're interested in. They also have a laparoscopic part now so um, it's pretty immediate and then it's metabolized by the biliary system so I can see why um, there's kind of a moment before it actually ends up in the liver for metabolizing. Uh, Martinez, uh, Tampa, I saw that you have four cases in which you changed your procedure because of the uh, technique you used. Did you you didn't talk about cases, and, and I assume these four cases, you preserved the organ because you found good perfusion. Yeah, um, so can you please clarify the question? Are you saying? Well, the question is, do you have cases where you resected the bowel or, or the, the organ because of bad perfusion, and how many? Yeah, so specifically four of them, we changed the operative plan, meaning the tissue looked viable and we were going to utilize it either for a rectal pull through, a colonic pull through, or a neovagina. And based on this intraoperative mo mode of spy utilization, we actually discarded the non-perfused part, port part of the bowel. So it changed dramatically enough that we would have otherwise had poorly perfused tissue that we would have left in situ. Did it have any pathologic findings? On, I assume you sent it to pathology. So was there anything unusual about it? Did it have obliteration of small blood vessels or anything else? Yeah, um, we did send it to pathology. I don't have that answer. Um, three of those specimens were distal rectum, which is the intramural blood supply. So I'm assuming that they probably spoke to some early congestion or coagulative necrosis. Um, it, it was just very obvious how much it did not perfuse on the intraoperative cyanine green. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. So the next talk is abstract number eight, gastrointestinal morbidity in adults following repair of simple neonatal gastroschisis to be presented by Dr. Goddard from Cincinnati, North Carolina, and Texas. Hi, I'm Jillian Goddard. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. The first successful report of gastroschisis was in 1878 by William Fear. However, in the 1940s, um, Survival from this disease was still uncommon. 1967 was a landmark year with the development of TPN by Dudrick, as well as the first report of a silo by Schuster. Over the past 50 years, survival from this disease has increased significantly, and today, infants born with gastroschisis have greater than a 90% survival rate. Because of this, and long-term outcomes in this patient population is still largely unknown. Um, in this study, we aimed to assess gastro gastrointestinal morbidity. Sorry. It's supposed to be the. Can you advance the slide? 
Um, in this study, we aim to evaluate gastrointestinal morbidity in adolescents greater than 12 and adults after repair for simple gastroschisis. We created an electronic survey in which subjects were recruited through a national gastroschisis network from July through September 2018. Demographics, complete medical and surgical history, as well as current health status was obtained. Quality of life was assessed using the short form, or SF12, which is a validated survey for adults. The survey was opened 195 times with 120 complete surveys. We used a broad definition of simple gastroschisis, which included um, no bowel surgery other than their initial repair and no bowel resection within their first year of life. We excluded patients less than 12 years of age with an unknown date of birth, unknown surgical history, or a history of complex gastroschisis. This resulted in 77 patients with simple gastroschisis consisting of 78 adults and 19 adolescents. Could you please advance the slide? Our respondents included um, were 75% female and had a mean age of 28, and 54% of these respondents um, had had additional surgery. Adults were more likely to be female, have required additional surgery, um, and have had a bowel resection compared to adolescents. Of those that required a bowel resection, six out of the seven had their surgery for resection done between 23 and 33 years of age. 65% of all respondents had experienced at least one GI symptom within the previous month, with most common symptoms being abdominal pain, um, constipation, and abdominal bloating. Adults were significantly more likely to have bloating, nausea, and heartburn compared to adolescents, whereas adolescents were more likely to be symptom-free. 35% of all respondents were symptom-free until six years of age, and there was no significant difference between age of onset or frequency between adult and adolescents. Due to our high female response rate, we also looked at gender differences and found that among adults, females were more likely to experience GI symptoms. However, of those that experienced GI symptoms, other than a male predominance for heartburn, there was no gender difference in type of symptom, age of onset, frequency, or number of GI symptoms experienced. Um, the SF12, with the such as quality of life, has both mental and physical components. Scores are standardized with the standard general population having a mean of 50, the standard deviation of 10. The general population uh, was shown as blue, um, and simple gastroschisis without GI symptoms are shown in green, and this did not have any difference um, in terms of mental or physical quality of life. Simple gastroschisis respondents who did have a GI symptom, however, had a lower mental quality of life. Looking at how each individual GI symptom affects quality of life, we found that abdominal pain, nausea, and constipation were significantly associated with a lower mental quality of life. Combined quality of life scores, um, which added up both the mental and physical components, are shown. For individuals that had three or more different GI symptoms within the last month, or if they experienced their symptoms on a weekly or daily basis, had significantly lower um, quality of life. 43% of adults and 21% of adolescents required at least one hospitalization for their GI symptom. Additionally, only 30% of adults and 78% of adolescents had said that they had found a doctor who had been helpful in addressing their GI symptom. Of adults who had found one, um, it took almost four doctors before they found one, someone that had been helpful. Also, among adults who had been tried to become pregnant, 42% experienced difficulties with infertility. In conclusion, this study highlights that not all patients um, go on to lead normal lives and have, um, as commonly told to parents today. Some infants born with gastroschisis will eventually have GI symptoms and may require surgical intervention as they age and as they become adults. Limitations of this study include the inherent methodology of our patient-reported survey, as well as our high female response rate. Additionally, um, patients were recruited through this national network, and patients without symptoms may not be in contact or connected to the organization. However, the study does highlight a need for further research in this area, as well as developing prospective res registries in order to determine the national, the natural, um, like 
the natural long-term outcomes of this disease as well as decreasing morbidity in this patient population. Thank you all, and I'll take questions. Eric Lazar from Morristown. Um, did you look at, thank you for even studying this issue, but had you ever looked at um, how many patients required imaging and evaluation of their symptoms, and how many did have any other subsequent surgical explorations or um, evaluations intraoperative? Um, so this is a, a prelim study where it was all self-reported and we didn't have patient records, so we did not ask about imaging characteristics. Um, we did ask for the the number of surgery and the type of surgery. And if the patient in their response had not explained in detail what their surgery was, they were excluded. Um, I've often thought we should tattoo instructions on the abdominal wall to other surgeons down the line, which warn that upper GIs will often look non-rotated or mal-rotated and they don't need to be corrected. Yeah. Um, and to be careful of that ligament that they want to lice so quickly at the top of the liver because that's often a hepatic vein. Because uh, we've, we've been called to the OR for all sorts of misadventures by those who don't really understand what a gastroschisis abdomen looks like down the road. And, um, and the studying, uh, also the studies and images are often misinterpreted um, in the setting of symptoms. So um, it would be good to follow up with, with that data. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next talk is Designing a Safer Gastrostomy Device, the Quest to Prevent G-Tube Dislodgement, by Dr. presented by Dr. Ruffalo, co-authors Foito, Puhamas, McGuire, and Wakeman from University of Rochester. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work from the University of Rochester. Could we advance the slide, please? Dr. Wakeman and myself have to disclose that we have a, co a um, preliminary patent on work related to, to this presentation. Here we are. So today I'll be talking to you about um, pediatric gastrostomy tubes and um, really a, a institutional-wide effort to try to decrease the morbidity associated with them. Um, we'll start with a brief overview of the previous uh, findings in the literature, um, as well as a novel design that um, we hope can help uh, address some of these issues. I'm sorry, I'm having some difficulty here. So pediatric gastrostomy tubes are one of the most uh, common surgical procedures performed on children um, every year. And they've long been um, associated with uh, increased utilization of healthcare um, uh, pertaining to G-tube related complaints. Previous um, work in the literature has shown shown that anywhere between 8 to 30 percent of patients will represent to emergency departments 30 days after placement of their pediatric um, G-tube with a G-tube related complaint. And those complaints range from anywhere from uh, wound related concerns, normal um, wound healing and development of granulation tissue, to mechanical concerns such as dislodgement or clogging of the tube. Previous work by Correa et al. found that um, as many as 60% of those visits to the emergency department are potentially avoidable um, if triaged over the phone. Um, and beyond the 30-day mark, when tracks are well formed, even, an even greater proportion of those uh, emergency department visits are potentially avoidable. I apologize. I have some videos that I think is lagging the, um, the, the presentation here. Because when I'm clicking, Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So, uh, however, from the work we know that um, the institution of pathways and uh, care bundles for patients with uh, pediatric G-tubes can actually improve um, the, the healthcare utilization by this group. Um, this is a, a very nice study from the group in Seattle, which found that after the implementation of a G-tube care bundle, they were able to decrease their subsequent uh, utilization of healthcare by that population. Uh, 
At our hospital at uh, Galsano Children's, we've formed a multidisciplinary um, uh, group of nurses, uh, surgeons, advanced practice providers, educators, and discharge coordinators to try to address um, the high utilization of healthcare in our population. An early needs assessment found that a, really a main driver of emergency department visits in our group was uh, driven by uh, dislodgements either greater than three months when we consider the tract to be uh, typically well formed and just needs a simple replacement or dislodgements within three months when uh, our standard of care is to perform a contrast study to confirm intergastric placement. In fact, when we looked retrospectively at all um, surgically placed, so this excludes interventional radiology and GI, uh, pediatric gastrostomy tubes, we found that 70% of the emergency department visits were due to dislodgement. And 51 out of those 145, so one third of those patients, were in the early period. So we started thinking of ourselves, if we have something that fails that often, is there a better way to engineer it so that um, we can prevent the morbidity in, in emergency department visits? We have patients that have presented to our emergency department 12 times. And we were, um, uh, we, we found some inspiration in our um, Macintosh laptops. So if for any of you that has a, um, a Mac laptop, you know that the, the coupling of the power from the power source to the computer is actually coupled with a magnet. And that allows the computer to get its power, but if your dog runs by and, and, and hits the cord, the, your computer doesn't go flying off the table. So we thought we could design a similar concept in, with a low-profile um, primary button that incorporated neodymium magnets. These are um, some of the strongest ferromagnetic um, compounds that uh, man knows, uh, both in the uh, connection tubing and in the hub of the uh, G-tube itself. The attraction between these two magnets would then hold the tube together but would dislodge if a force greater than a predetermined amount of, um, of tension was applied to the, to the G-tube. We also incorporated um, some basic engineering. We, uh, there's a valve and a nozzle mechanism that prevents reflux of the gastric contents um, from the G-tube when the cord is um, uh, engaged. And when it, it, it's engaged, it allows the passage of fluid um, anti-grade. So these, um, these are examples of uh, two different uh, prototypes that I made with nothing but some uh, magnets that I bought online and some Gorilla Glue. And you can see that they're, it, they're actually pretty simple to make if I can do it. Um, we also made um, another uh, version that incorporates the normal coupling of the uh, G-tube to the... Um, to the feed line, but that has a magnetic coupling in line. The idea being here that um, you could potentially have uh, patients that wouldn't be able to have a magnet uh, on their body, and, and through this type of mechanism would still have some benefit. I then enlisted the help of some field uh, consultants, my kids, um, and, and spent a good weekend having them tug at all these different prototypes, and um, we broke a lot of uh, G-tubes. Um, and to try to get a range of how much force we would need to have to, to make this uh, worthwhile, this is uh, one such test by my son. And what we found is that the, the force that um, we, the sort of the therapy force that we can apply to these tubes is uh, modifiable between 1 to 17 pounds depending on the m number of magnets, where you place the magnet, um, uh, and really depends on if it's a, a one-time tug or, or a, a static force that's being applied. And you, could, you could imagine that there would be different um, circumstances where you would need more or less force, so we're um, encouraged by that. So in the future, we're hoping to partner with some real engineers to produce um, a more clinical prototype um, and meet some of the regulatory hurdles that uh, are needed to, to bring this type of product uh, to our patients. Um, once we have a more, uh, more uh, robust model, we'll also be testing it in um, some uh, pig abdominal wall models um, with the hope that eventually we can get a product um, that will help reduce the number of dislodgements that we see in the emergency de department. In addition, uh, I've certainly um, have admitted and taken care of patients who have come in with traumatic um, 
uh, urinary catheter dislodgements or loss of percutaneous strains. So I think that this, this concept is really, really applicable to other, um, other areas. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. We'll have time for one question. Oh, thanks so much, uh, James Wall from uh, Stanford. Uh, congratulations, nice job on a really good needs finding and figuring out what the core problem is with, from the patient perspective. Do you think that the two questions wrapped into one since we only have one, do you think the core problem is, uh, is really tugging on the tube versus at the base? Um, and is there a potential solution from that? And two, how much cost do you think this will add and how are you gonna argue for that to be worth us paying? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, I'll start with the first. I think that any what we have found actually in our inpatient data is that tubes tend to fall out when they're hooked up to the line. Um, the the um, buttons themselves can still get dislodged, in particular when the kids are sliding down from the bed, for example, and there's friction up against the abdominal wall. But um, there's something about that tube being fixed to a static object that puts it at risk for dislodgement. Um, if your second question for cost, uh, I, I, to be honest, it's a little hard for me to say. Preliminarily, I've, um, we've, we've done some cost uh, assessments, and we have found that the um, the there is a, a there is some some significant cost that we see from these visits. Um, but interestingly, a lot of that cost is clustered amongst the relatively few number of patients. So about 20% of the patients drive 80% of the cost at our emergency department from these dislodgements. Um, and those patients are disproportionately more likely to dislodge both in the first three months and after. So the, you could see a rationale that it would actually decrease that cost. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, one quick announcement, if anybody has the audience response clickers still from the previous talks, you can return those at the ABSA registration desk. Is Dr. Taylor here? Yes? Okay. So Dr. Taylor is going to round out this session with the last two talks. Uh, the first one is abstract number four, endoluminal functional imaging and dilation, early experience with endoscopic impedance-based measurements and dilation in pediatric patients. And he's coming to us from Stanford. All right, thank you for the opportunity to present. My name is Jordan Taylor. I'm one of the research fellows at Stanford University in the Division of Pediatric Surgery. Let's see if I can do better on the clicker here. Nope. There we go. We have no disclosures. Still not sure which one's supposed to work. Thank you. All right. Um, esophageal dilation is a relatively common procedure in pediatric surgery. Um, there are numerous indications and disease processes that might require dilation of the esophagus. In particular, I'll note uh, esophageal stricture secondary to a previous uh, TEF repair is particularly common. Up to 30% of patients that have had tracheal esophageal fistula repair develop strictures in the first year after surgery. Um, patients with achalasia as well might require dilation either before or after definitive surgical management. Traditionally, these dilations are done with balloon dilation under fluoroscopy. And while this method can be effective, it has certain limitations, one of which is that it provides imprecise measurements of the esophagus before and after dilation. It also requires fluoroscopy and radiation exposure for these patients. One of the newer technologies that we've been utilizing over the last few years is endoluminal functional imaging and dilating probes. These are impedance-based probes that take measurements and can dilate that don't require any radiation or fluoroscopy. The catheter has an array of electrodes along, uh, along the length of it that measure the voltage at different areas. It can then measure the impedance along the balloon, and from that we can derive very precise cross-sectional areas and diameters of the esophagus. The graphical interface gives real-time feedback as to the diameter of the esophagus at different levels. This is one of the diagnostic balloons, and you can see that this patient has a uh, narrowing that's at, at smallest point is 5.4 millimeters. 
Recently, we published the first use of the dilating function of this technology in pediatric patients. And here you can see one of the pre and post dilation images that we can see where this patient had an increase of about two and a half millimeters in their diameter. So the aim of our project here was just to describe some of our early experience. Over the last two and a half years, we've uh, recruited and done this, used this technology in 47 patients, slight predominance male with an average age of 12. From these patients, we've done 75 procedures, the majority of which have been diagnostic, although we've done 20 procedures that have involved dilation using this technology. When we're doing the dilation, the majority of them are for achalasia, uh, though we have had some that are also for strictures after tracheoesophageal fistula repair. As you might imagine, the location of these uh, narrowings is typically lower down in the esophagus, though this technology can be used uh, in both the mid esophagus and the upper esophagus. The procedure time and, and a median has been 28 minutes, though it varies considerably depending on other procedures being done. And what we found is that uh, there's an uh, average increase in diameter of 3.7 millimeters in the patients. We've had uh, everyone in, have an increase uh, in the diameter in the post dilation measurement except for one patient um, shown there in red. And this patient had an esophageal spasm as related to the dilation and uh, we think this affected the measurement. This patient did go on to have good symptom relief after dilating the uh, stricture. We've had no intraoperative complications and our short and intermediate term outcomes have been very good with no complications in the first 190 days, or I'm sorry, in the average 190 day follow up that we've had. So in conclusion, we believe that we've shown that endoluminal functional imaging probes are safe and feasible for measuring and dilating the esophagus in pediatric patients. It has the added benefit that it gives you precise measurements for both pre and post dilations. There's no fluoroscopy required or radiation exposure during this procedure. And in the future, we're going to continue to monitor our use and complications that might arise. Uh, and we also want to quantify how much radiation exposure are we actually saving by using this technology compared to fluoro. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Wallace, my PI in this project, and happy to take any questions. Kathy Barson, Chicago. Um, it's great to use this for the esophageal dilatation. So I'm just curious because one of the great areas in which it's been utilized is not for dilating an achalasia, but it's to measure the adequacy of your myotomy. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the suspicions as to why POMs, at least in the adult population, have better outcomes in type 1 and type 3 achalasias because their myotomy is much longer than it is with a standard heller. So I'm just curious what your experience is using FLIP technology both for achalasia, in achalasia to assess the adequacy of your treatment of your myotomy both with POM and without. I'm just curious if that's within your 55 diagnostic ones. It is, yes. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. So we have been using uh, this technology in patients that uh, get the POEM um, at, our, at our center. Um, it's our standard of practice to make these measurements both before and after the myotomy to give some quantifiable number to what we actually achieved by the myotomy. And relative to doing it, are you do you also do are you doing all poems or are you also doing standard hellers? So uh, it's it's a little surgeon dependent at our institution. The majority of of uh, the achalasia patients are being treated with poem at our institution as have, a, as a primary. And attempt. have you done flip in both? Have you done this in both the in hellers? Patients as, that have had poem and, and yeah. heller. Yes, we have. Yeah. Okay. I can't, I can't tell you if, if we have better data on one versus the other, but uh, I know that we have been. I'm curious uh, doing to see these data once you present them. Thank you. Thanks. One quick question for you is, is this balloon, the, you use the same one to make the measurements as you do to dilate? The yeah. balloon is robust enough to do both tasks? Yeah. So there are two iterations, one that does just measurements. It is a very soft compliant balloon. Um, there's another one that does allow you to do measurements and then can dilate and stiff enough to, to dilate the esophagus. Okay. Good, really interesting. Well, we'll move on with your second talk and sure. the final talk of this session. Um, this one is endoscopic closure of gastrocutaneous fistula, modified technique with overscope clip. To be presented again by Dr. Taylor. Thank you. You can play the video for this one. I was told not to narrate, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> Topic closure of a gastrocutaneous fistula using a modified technique with the overscope clip.
Gastrostomy tubes are common in pediatrics. In 2009, there was an estimated 18.5 per 100,000 children in the U.S. who had G-tubes. They can be placed through open surgery, laparoscopically, endoscopically, and with interventional radiology. Though sometimes intended for more permanent enteral access, they are frequently used for temporary access in pediatrics, with durations ranging from two months to several years. When G-tubes are removed, the sites usually close spontaneously in the first one to two weeks. If they don't close, they can develop persistent gastrocutaneous fistulas. The duration of the G-tube is the most predictive factor for persistent gastrocutaneous fistulas. One study showed that open surgery may have a higher risk of persistent gastrocutaneous fistula compared to laparoscopic. Though nutritional status, steroid use, abdominal wall thickness are not predictive for developing gastrocutaneous fistulas. Treatment of gastrocutaneous fistulas begins with conservative management, including local skin care and H2 blockers. Few groups have had success using various devices in an off-label fashion, but often these patients require definitive surgical intervention. There are open and laparoscopic techniques for closing gastrocutaneous fistulas, though the trend seems to be towards more minimally invasive, including endoscopic approaches. One of the newest technologies is an endoscopic approach using an overscope clip. These clips are made of nitinol, a biocompatible metal that has a memory, allowing it to spring back into a closed position once it's deployed. When successful, these clips can completely close a gastrocutaneous fistula, though centering the scope around the fistula can be difficult. If the scope is off-centered, the clip may misfire and the fistula will remain patent. Our technique is a simple modification to help keep the scope centered and prevent misfires of the clip. This case is of a 17-year-old who had a previous G-tube and developed a gastrocutaneous fistula with complications related to the skin. An endoscopic grasper is advanced through the gastrocutaneous fistula until it is seen on the outside. Here you see the grasper coming through the fistula, but you can also note the poor quality of the skin as a result of the fistula. A 1-0 vicral suture is passed externally using the grasper. Once in the stomach, it will be used to guide the scope towards the stomach wall. Back tension is applied to the suture in order to direct the scope to be perpendicular to both the stomach wall and the abdominal wall. Once the scope is in a satisfactory position, suction is applied to bring the gastric mucosa into the scope. The clip is then deployed while the mucosa is on suction. The GCF was inspected and found to be well closed. The suture was cut externally and released internally. The patient has done well with the fistula now closed and the skin healing. Endoscopic gastrocutaneous fistula closure is an effective alternative to open or laparoscopic surgery, especially in patients with skin excoriation. This simple technique of using a trans fistula centering suture can ensure complete closure when using the overscope clip. This is important for larger fistulas, greater than one centimeter, though there's no reason this can't be used in routine use. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Jennifer Tillmans, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, I was wondering, have you had any experience with long-term outcomes with these clips? Like whether or not they eventually erode or if they actually fall off? And have you had any experience with recurrence after placing the clips? Thank you for your questions. So as far as the long-term outcomes, we have monitored um, our use of this technology and the patients thereafter. Um, the majority of them, they do, they falls off with the mucosa after some time um, and is passed. Um, as far as the recurrence, um, we have seen some failures of this. So uh, in particular in, in fistulas that are larger than one centimeter, um, we've actually employed this knowing that we're not going to be able to entirely close uh, the fistula. But we can narrow it and limit the amount of gastric content that's then pouring out onto the skin and help healing. Um, so we've we've been using this, um, you know, for a variety of purposes. <laughs>
Does the um, internal friability play a, a part in terms of whether or not you actually apply the clip or do something else? Like, do you ever get in there and, and decide the tissue is a little too friable? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I can I can answer that appropriately. I haven't reviewed all of the cases and the, the, the notes as far as determining if they were going to apply this or not. I'd imagine that the friability of the mucosa would play a play a role in whether or not this is successful or not, though. Okay. I only ask because we've had. I'm dealing with a bear claw that's eroded halfway into ah. from someone who tried to close it with the, a fistula. So that's what I was asking. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.